Hi, I'm Christy Shriver, and we're here to discuss books that have changed the world and have changed us. And I'm Gary Shriver, and this is the How to Love Lit podcast. This is our third episode focusing on Harper Lee's popular classic, To Kill a Mockingbird. In episode one, we discussed the context of Lee's personal story, um, you know, such as we know it. Uh, her second more controversial novel, as crazy as it sounds as this, this one was not free of controversy, and as well as the very beginning of the book. Last episode, we talked about themes and motifs and ideas that Lee develops first in part one, but continuously throughout the second section of the novel um, as well. We talked about her use of delightful animal imagery and, um, you know, how through the sights and sounds of uh, rural America that we can enter into a world of natural innocence. You know, the the innocence of childhood, the, of the child of our three protagonist children, um, Jim and Scout and Dill. We discuss the vantage point uh, from which we are to view our story, you know, that of a child, uh, but also a female child. This is the story of a girl, a little girl growing up in the segregated South. It's set in the 1930s, um, but perhaps anachronistically. I mean, uh, as the world she describes is about to go to war, you know, but not the World War of Europe. Uh, another American Civil War fought um uh, on the battlefield of a small microcosm of an American town, Macomb, Alabama. And, and it's fought within the heart and soul of every American, both black and white, uh, who was to call the American South their home. Right. And last week we brought out the idea that those are the particulars of a more universal story. The story of all of us really is fear and acceptance and ignorance and education. Well, these are all struggles that exist outside the context of the segregated South. However, this week we will turn to the particular problem of the segregated South and we will look at it in all of its brutality, racial injustice. 15% of the novel centers on one courthouse, the Macomb County Courthouse. The battle lines have been drawn by one particularly feral piece of human trash to use Atticus's word, Robert E. Lee Yule, named, of course, after that famous Confederate general. Everyone in Macon will take a side. But, as is always the case with great literature, there is a lot of context, particular to this moment in history. You know, you don't really need all of the historical context to understand the story. You don't really even need it to understand the universal truths. But hopefully we can use our understanding of Harper Lee's historical particulars of this context and let it enhance our understanding of her meaning in general. Instead of just talking through the story, this episode we're going to explore the historical, legal context of this great fictional civil rights battle. A battle Atticus told us he never had a chance at winning, but a fight still worth fighting. Atticus knew it would take more than one battle, but he was in all the way because that is courage. The principle he's willing to burn down his entire world over, he plainly frames in his closing arguments at the end of Tom Robinson's trial. He quotes a founding father, the man who personified more than any one individual on the American continent, the contradiction of the American experience. That would be Thomas Jefferson. And Atticus' closing arguments to the jury before sending them off to inevitably commit injustice, this is what he says. One more thing, gentlemen, before I quit. Thomas Jefferson once said that all men are created equal, a phrase that the Yankees and the distaff side of the executive branch in Washington are fond of hurling at us. There is a tendency in this year of grace, 1935, for certain people to use this phrase out of context to satisfy all conditions. The most ridiculous example I can think of is that the people who run public education promote this stupid and idle along with the industrious. Because all men are created equal, educators will gravely tell you the children left behind suffer terrible feelings of inferiority. We know all men are not created equal in the same sense some people would have us believe. Some people are smarter than others. Some people have more opportunity because they're born with it. Some men make more money than others. Some ladies make better cakes than others. 
Some people are born gifted beyond the normal scope of most men. But there is one way in this country in which all men are created equal. There is one human institution that makes a pauper the equal of a Rockefeller, the stupid man the equal of an Einstein, and the ignorant man the equal of any college president. That institution, gentlemen, is a court. It can be the Supreme Court of the United States or the humble P.O. Court in this land or this honorable court which you serve. Our courts have their faults, as does any human institution, but in this country our courts are the great levelers, and in our courts all men are created equal. You know, I really love those closing remarks, and for one reason, because it takes another jab at one more <laughs> fallacy of education mm-hmm. that really irks me to no end, this idea that instead of helping children achieve greatness, we push them through and promote them because we apparently feel they can do no better. So we will just pretend we haven't noticed that they didn't achieve the expectations set for others because we really never believed they could have anyway. I mean, passing a student who didn't pass is a declaration of true apathy, and the ultimate systematic admission that we just don't feel you're capable. It's the ultimate insult to both child and teacher, and I love that Lee just threw that pot shot gratuitously, almost as if she were a grizzled frontline educator herself. But of course, that's not her main point, and certainly not where we should focus. Remember, Atticus is not a real person. Atticus is a character. He's a moral archetype, so to speak. Atticus reflects nobility, and because he's fictional, he can be the ultimate lawyer. We don't and we shouldn't focus on any personal flaw or blind spot, if we want to use his words. Instead of focusing on any shortcoming, let's focus on what he does right. He fights. He fights because it is right, even though he knows he will lose. He knows the prejudice and ignorance and fear in the hearts of his jury will ultimately commit the highest insult to the laws of God. They will murder an innocent man. And it is to this he speaks. He lectures us on our human hypocrisy wherever it lurks. If we are not equal before God and in man in a court of law where the stakes are life and death, then it is a concept that we can't really claim exists at all. Let me finish his lines and those closing arguments. I'm no idealist to believe firmly in the integrity of our courts and in the jury system. That is no ideal to me. It is a living, working reality. Gentlemen, a court is no better than each man of you sitting before me on this jury. A court is only as sound as its jury, and a jury is only as sound as the men who make it up. And there, ladies and gentlemen, (laughs) is our problem. (laughs) The premise and conclusion on which rides this entire book, the problem is we are not sound. Our society is not sound. And therefore, we must regroup internally, every single one of us, on an individual level. And if we don't, our society will collapse. The story is set in the 1930s. But remember... Lee is watching the world of the 1950s collapse before her very eyes under the weight of racial injustice. And of course, this is a question every generation of every race must ask itself. Are we willing to look inward? So let's look at Lee's world. What is she seeing? What is happening in America in the first half of the 20th century? Gary, is she recreating in fictional world, vaguely, something that's happening in the real world? Well, the short answer to that is yes. (laughs) (laughs) But let me start by saying um, the Tom Robinson case is not a single case that is thinly veiled. It it represents, um, you know, an amalgamation of several different cases, some that were local and perhaps not publicized. You know, unfortunately, there are many examples that parallel the injustice expressed through the character of Tom Robinson. But there are a couple of notable trials that any person of Harper Lee's era would recognize. A couple of specific cases that blend into her story very directly. I want to focus on a few important uh, court cases that made international news at the time and really struck at the heart of the American consciousness as a collective entity. Uh, Two are trials of terrible atrocities. 
but another uh, that creates a subtext and explains the irrational fear that's turning normally um, law-abiding citizens really into barbarous, you know, murderers. Um, Atticus, as an archetype, sees making society capable of evolving, uh, you know, too slowly, admittedly, but uh, essentially evolving in the right direction. Uh, his goal is to support this transition with the way he raises his children and conducts himself professionally, which in this case would include stop victimizing the innocent, as personified by Tom Robinson, you know. So let's look at uh, three very famous cases, which undoubtedly were in the forefront of Lee's mind. We'll start with the one that most closely connects with the time period of the setting in Lee's novel, and that's the infamous Scottsboro case in 1931, two years before Dill takes the first train from Meridian, Alabama, over to Macon, Alabama. <laughs> well, I want to interrupt you and say, before we get too far in, if you're interested in the story of the Scottsboro trial in 2010... They produced a Broadway musical about it, if you can believe that, and it's called The Scottsboro Boys. <laughs> Not, well, you know, thematically, that's a slightly darker story than your high school musical. <laughs> I know, right? But it did earn 12 Tony nominations, so there's an aside. But let's get back. So what is The Scottsboro Trial? Tell us the story. Well, it was a rape trial. Um, on March 25th, 1931, um, nine young African-American teenagers between the ages of 13 and 19 were arrested in Paint Rock, Alabama, and they were charged with the forcible rape of two white women. Uh, the crime allegedly occurring on a moving train, and was they were eventually tried in Scottsboro, Alabama. The, the first trial lasted only 12 days after the initial arrest. You know, the boys were denied the right to counsel and due process, which is really, it's guaranteed for all Americans under the Fourth and Fifth Amendment. The boys, the youngest of which was 13 years old, by the way, they were all found guilty, but the youngest were, all but the youngest were sentenced to the death penalty. And their executions were set for July 10th, which is basically immediately in a total farce, um, really, as was the entire spectacle of the trial. Uh, and it was a spectacle. I mean, it was a mob spectacle. Um, 10,000 people showed up for the trial. It took 100 National Guardsmen just to protect the defendants from the mob that threatened to lynch them. Uh, it was public. It was emotional. It had no resemblance to any form of justice, nor were there any claims of relying on facts in order to convict the boys. So what happened? Did they kill the boys? What actually happened on that train? What started the whole thing? You know, uh, what exactly happened, as far as I know, is slightly ambiguous, and it's definitely complicated. But back in the days of the Depression, and I know most of us have seen this in movies, but in those days, uh, mostly, but sometimes, mostly men, but sometimes women, both white and African-American, would jump on freight trains and catch rides across the country because they couldn't afford a real ticket. They called this hoboing. And kind of an interesting historical note aside, that during the, the Great Depression and the New Deal, they estimated as many as 250,000 teenagers were randomly riding the rails oh at gosh. any time. So, you know, it's just a group of abandoned children. Uh, you know, in this case, a group of white boys wearing an open-topped freight car uh, designed to be filled with gravel when a group of 15 African-Americans jumped in and a fight broke out between the groups, uh, which resulted in all but one of the white boys getting thrown off the train. Several of the boys who got thrown off reported the incident to the station master in Stevenson, um, which is the closest stop. And the problem here revolved around two white girls who were wearing overalls and hitching a ride to Huntsville, Alabama from Chattanooga, Tennessee. And, and inside that same car, they were in that same car where the fight broke out. Their story is really reminiscent of the stunt that Mayella Yule pulls in our book. Um, nine African-American boys were arrested when they got to the next town, You know, which, by the way, only four of them uh, even knew each other before that day. What if ever happened to the rest of the African-American boys in that train car? You know, nobody knows what happened. They were left completely out of it. But it was Victoria Price and Ruby Bates that caused the stir. Victoria, according to later testimony, and I'll use the exact words of character witnesses from court transcripts about the girls. Here are a few quotes. They were notorious prostitutes. And one of them was arrested in a disorderly house in flagrante delicto with a colored man. 
Another witness claimed that one of them had asked to meet and have intercourse with three men on one afternoon. Uh, one of them was, and I quote, drunk and in a fight with another woman, and she had her clothes up around her body and exposed her private parts in a drunk and disgraceful spectacle in the presence of a number of colored people. Uh, so you get the idea that uh, Victoria and Ruby uh, may not have been the most reputable girls in <laughs> Alabama, which for us today, it doesn't sound like it should even be relevant. After all, their reputation in no way discounts whether they were or were not raped. That's not why we bring it up. The problem was that these sort of things are not legal in the state of Alabama in the 1930s. They were in legal trouble of their own. When the doctor inspected the girls, there were signs of them having had intercourse, but no signs of violence of any kind. Uh, the women faced charges of vagrancy and illegal sexual activity. So, you know, by accusing the Scottsboro defendants of rape, they are no longer criminals, but they are the victims. And that's what I mean by saying the truth is complicated. This trial was never about truth finding. The incident quickly turned into a, a real mockery of the legal system and the astonishingly uh, blunt falseness of the stories that started to come out were shocking even for that era. Uh, the fact that without trial or representation, nine children were being legally murdered garnered national attention and international attention. Um, fortunately, this attention resulted in a stay of execution. Uh, there was a real investigation, and ultimately, after decades of wrongful incarceration for the boys uh, and some more retrials, a, a sort of a version of justice finally emerged. But everyone in the world knew the true crime was not what had happened on train, but what the 12 white men of the jury in Scottsboro had done. It was a blatant legal attempt at murder. You know, uh, Ruby Bates, one of the girls, actually testified for the defense in later trials, totally recanting her original story. She even toured the country raising support and funds for the defendants. And it took 40 years, uh, but eventually the state of Alabama, uh, ironically, through the person of the, the person of the infamous segregationist George Wallace, they acknowledged the innocence of Clarence Norris, one of the remaining living defendants, and pardoned him in uh, 1976 on the grounds of their being innocent. And the Scottsboro case was the first time in the history of Alabama that the state ever conferred a pardon on the basis of innocence. Usually a pardon means forgiveness, but in this case, the state of Alabama admitted innocence for the nine African-Americans. Uh, this process of retrial and appeal was going on right around the corner from where Harper Lee was writing her book. This was her world, her life, what was going on. And it wasn't until 2013 uh, that the Alabama Board of Pardons and Paroles voted unanimously to pardon all of them. But unfortunately, they were already dead by then. Well, part two of Lee's book opens up drawing our attention to Calpurnia, our African-American hero, uh, by Al Aunt Alexandra, one of the spokespersons, really, for the voice of Maycomb. Aunt Alexandra is the status quo of the ambitious, racist, passive-aggressive white women that we keep reading about in this book. Calpurnia is like Atticus. Although she lives in this world, she is not of this world. And we'll talk next week or next episode about how she herself, in order to survive, must become a mockingbird. But here, the first few chapters set up the race issue and demonstrate the unequal hierarchies inherent in the relationship between the Finch children and the woman who loves and raises them. Inequalities they are not even aware exist. In the words of Scout, Calpurnia led a modest double life never dawned on me. The idea that she had a separate existence outside of our household was a novel one. Of course, uh, not understanding that the world doesn't revolve around you, you know, is an affliction every child has, and usually life beats that out of you. <laughs> <laughs> but Scout, and this is what Lee's pointing out, has a racial blind spot of her own, if we want to use Atticus's wildly underestimate, um, understated euphemism. And we're to see that it affects even how she understands Calpurnia, the woman in her life who raises her. So in these early chapters of part two, Calpurnia takes the children to church. Aunt Alexandra moves in. Dill runs away from his home in Mississippi and shows up in the middle of the night at the Finches. But not very 
far into the section, our attention is drawn to the racial tensions of this community in chapter 15. A crowd has gathered and is ready to lynch Tom Robinson. And this is before the trial of the alleged rape of Mayella Yule, daughter of Robert E. Lee Yule, even starts. Of course, Atticus has blind spots, as we discussed last episode. But in chapter 16, to the rage of his son, who understands how dangerous things can get, Atticus labels what almost happened that night at the country or at the county jail when Mr. Cunningham threatens to kill him and his children. He labels it a blind spot. So let's talk about these so-called blind spots because it is an interesting choice of words that Mrs. Lee makes, and she's using it to reference people's prejudices. They certainly were blind spots in Scottsboro. And what I want to point out is in the case of the Scottsboro trial and in the Robinson trial, and later we're going to see in the Emmett Till trial, these blind spots result in crowds and mob violence. Lee opens up her introduction to Tom Robinson by introducing us to a crowd. The same year, Lee publishes her book, a Bulgarian-born man by the name of Elias Canetti publishes his seminal work, Crowds and Power. That work contextualizes what happened in Scottsboro and what happens in Maycomb. Kennedy, you know, went on to win the Nobel Prize uh, for his work, but interestingly enough, in his book, he talks about the very things that Lee tries to illustrate or does illustrate in Chapter 15 of what happens on the eve of Tom Robinson's trial. Well, the first point to make is fairly obvious. Um, Kennedy claims the destructiveness of the crowd is often its most conspicuous quality, which we certainly see in a lot of places, including uh, the racial mobs of the South. But it's interesting in Lee's case, there's another contributing factor to the racial injustice of Maycomb uh, that Kennedy highlights, and it can be seen in this almost lethally destructive crowd in Chapter 15. You know, we as humans um, like to think of ourselves as individuals, which, of course, we are. And we're defined that way. Uh, we each have the ability to choose and build our really our own reality to one extent or another. However, uh, as individuals, our choices are constrained because we are trapped in hierarchies. And, you know, no one escapes this in the real world and no one escapes this in Maycomb. And this is one of Lee's motifs, and she references it all the time. She calls these different hierarchical groups, tribes, or castes. We're always painfully aware of where we fall in the hierarchy, and we can't escape our place in them, and, and you know, unless unless we're in a crowd. You know, one distinctive of a crowd is a lack of hierarchy. Everyone is equal in the crowd. You know, subordinate only to the cause. And in chapter fifteen. The sheriff moves Robinson into the county jail and a crowd forms, a crowd Kennedy would refer to as a baiting crowd, a crowd bent on killing its chosen target. You know, that, that term baiting crowd can be confusing. So if you want another great example of what a baiting crowd is, you don't have to think any farther than the New Testament of, of the Bible because there was a crowd, a baiting crowd, that emerged to crucify Jesus Christ. That crowd in the biblical text served no other purpose but to bait and kill Jesus Christ for a reason maybe most of them could hardly articulate. What's interesting about this crowd in Maycomb, though, is that no one in, in the crowd is from that highest caste in Maycomb, the town people. We know this because when Scout invades the crowd, well, that's the first thing she notices. She doesn't know anyone. She doesn't know anyone. No one's there from her caste. She does see and identify one member of the lower caste that she just happens to know because her dad had helped him before, Mr. Cunningham. He was the father of her classmate, Walter Cunningham, the one who had no lunch, the one who got her in so much trouble on that first day of school. <laughs> You know, Kennedy uh, points out that in the crowd, people feel equal, and they are equal. That is, until the crowd disintegrates. And when Scout calls him out by name, for him, that crowd disintegrated immediately. He was no longer anonymous. And, of course, crowds will always disintegrate. You know, the illusion of equality will fade away, and individuality emerges again, and you're left with the consequences. And 
In the case of our crowd, scouts calling Walter Cunningham by his name breaks the illusion of equality. Uh, Mr. Walter Cunningham is called out as an individual, and Atticus is reestablished in a place of power. Even his posture expresses this, and uh, the way he controls time expresses this. And he gets from up from his chair slowly, and he stands, and you know he stands to convey independence, and he stands to take a stand. I mean, it's very symbolic, and the man with the power is Atticus, not the crowd. But really, how Atticus was able to reestablish his authority or reestablish the hierarchy had everything to do with Scout. Scout reminded Cunningham that he was first and foremost an individual. And as an individual, he was a good human being. And as an individual, he is not the kind of person to murder. And Atticus comments on that in chapter 16. He says this, and I'll quote, That proves something that a gang of wild animals can be stopped simply because they're still human. Hmm, maybe we need a police force of children. You children last night made Walter Cunningham stand in my shoes for a minute. That was enough. Of course, you know, I don't want to get too ahead of ourselves in the history of the civil rights movement. There's a podcast for that. But this does remind me that this is exactly what Dr. King would do in Birmingham just a few short years later. He did raise an army of children, and that army of children did bring the national consciousness to that same place just like Scout does. But back to our story, what we're looking at in this crowd is fear. When I read this book the first time, that confused me. I did not understand what these men were afraid of. I could not understand why anyone would defend that garbage-dwelling Yule man. They're, I mean, these are literally the only people in the entire community that our hero, Atticus, has ever bad in front of his children. I mean, he gives grace to the drug addict, Mean Woman. These people, Robert E. Lee Yule, is literally despised by all of Maycomb. In fact, the Yules have been despised for three generations. Well, at least they're consistent. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and they live in the trash. Why would anyone defend them, especially when it is clear that no one believes them? No one in this town, never mind the fact that Tom Robinson, everybody does like and knows he's a good person, but no one in this town believes Mayella Yule was raped by Tom Robinson. Why, first of all, would they even passively allow this to happen? But what's worse, why in the Tar Nations would there be a crowd bent on his defense? There has to be something deeper going on. Aaron Sorkin, when he made the play recently that came through Memphis, and it was really wonderful, he tried to show this and make this evident. But it's difficult to understand. So Gary talked to us very explicitly about the historical forces at work that would create this reality. Why would a mob of 10,000 show up to support two unknown women that they considered to be basically worthless prostitutes in Scottsboro for a rape that they knew didn't happen? Why would the Cunninghams show up to support Robert E. Lee Yule in a rape that they knew didn't happen? Yes, and you know, this brings me to the second big historical trial that I wanted to bring up uh, at first that doesn't seem to directly connect to Tom Robinson, but we will see that it has everything to do with it. In uh, 1954, the Supreme Court of the United States made one of the most famous decisions that it has made in American history. That case was Brown versus Board of Education. Up to that point, segregation was not only practice, it was enshrined and legal in what we call Jim Crow laws or, or segregation laws. It was actually illegal to mix races in most settings. And a white child must attend a white school, black child must attend a black school, even if they wanted to attend the other one. Things were supposedly separate but equal, which was common legal language. And this had been the law since Plessy versus Ferguson enshrined it in 1896. And the practice um, in and the subtext in the South was that any kind of mixing of races would imply social equality. And African Americans were supposed to, and I quote, know their place. And Jim Crow laws were violently enforced. And when the federal government came to integrate Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas, it took federal troops to enforce it, you know. But what was so dangerous about students mixing races in school, I mean, 
why was the South so afraid of that? Um, you know, a lot of historians and social scientists pretty much will agree and tell you it had everything to do with sex. <laughs> Doesn't it always come yeah. down to that? You know, sex was the principle surrounding um, all of those segregation laws. And citizen councils put it in writing, uh, you know, although I won't read what they said because it's very insulting and not necessary. But mixing races in school meant girls and boys of both races would have the opportunity to meet each other and they might fall in love. They might have sex. That's why we have a mob in Chapter 15. And that was ultimately Tom Robinson's crime. Uh, if we read the trial scene... With that understanding in mind, it becomes glaringly obvious that Tom was never being tried for raping Mayella. He was being tried for attracting the attention of Mayella, for not knowing his place, for daring to allow a white girl to be interested in him. Whew. Well, and that way, we as readers in the 21st century are exactly, we're just like scouts. We can't understand that subtext. We don't know that the subtext that everything that's happening in that courtroom is about sex and not the so-called alleged rape. In fact, Bob Yule is implied to have raped Mayella himself. When Atticus asks Tom Robinson what happened the day he went inside the Yule house, we learn that she approached him. She kissed him and she said she'd never kissed anyone before. And let me quote what she said here. What her papa do to her don't count. Woof! That's sick. And it's revealing. And what's even more horrifyingly sad about all that, and something that Atticus points out from almost the very beginning of the trial, is that neither Bob Yule nor the sheriff seem to have cared about Mayella at all. Sheriff Tate, upon hearing that a woman had been raped, did not even call a doctor her personhood was of no consequence her value as an individual human was of no value bob yule beat her to a pulp after having previously raped her himself probably on a regular basis but that's of no consequence and this is where lee's female perspective is really important this is where we walk in mayella's shoes and perhaps in the shoes of those girls who claim to have been raped in Scottsboro. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't want to justify what Mayella did, and I'm certainly not justifying accusing anyone of rape. I'm not. But it is interesting that Lee spends quite some time detailing the horrible existence of Mayella Yule. As Scout watches Mayella react in histrionics when her father calls, well, when Atticus calls her ma'am, you know, Scout forms this question, what on earth was her life like? And of course, chapters 18 through 20, you know, we get to know what her life was like. She was a slave. She was mostly unfed. She was cold. She had little to no education. She had no mother. No one loved her. She had no friends. Although we don't find ourselves pitying her by the end because of her part in the killing of Tom Robinson, we must understand how she got there. And that's the same for Victoria Price and Ruby Bates in the Scottsboro case. These women were mill girls from Huntsville, Alabama. Gary, tell us, what is that reality about? Well, I'm not sure about them personally, but I can tell you that there were four mills in that area and none of them would provide a livable wage. The hours were long, the working conditions were bad, and only the lowest people in the world would work there. So to be a mill girl would be the lowest you could be. To be a woman in these conditions was worse than to be a man. And in the case of Price and Bates, neither of them had a father, which means they were left on their own to find a place to live. And in mill towns, many women uh, had almost no option at all except prostitution. And these two girls came from pretty much the most economically oppressed environment possible. And again, just like Mayella, it's not that we can look at them and uh, c condone or accept what they did to those nine men. We certainly cannot. But we can, if we walk in their shoes, you know, to use Lee's term, understand how they got there. I mean, all of it's tragic. Everything in it, about it is tra tragic. Well, and in the trial in Maycomb, the Ewells have their say. The sheriff has his say. Tom Robinson has his say. Which brings us to the most galvanizing and horrific event of the early civil rights moment 
trial of Roy Bryant and J.W. Milam in September of 1955 over the brutal murder of Emmett Till. This trial would have been fresh on the mind of Harper Lee as she penned her trial of Tom Robinson. Emmett Till's crime uh, was that he made a sound at a white woman that was described as a wolf whistle. And, you know, this was taken to be a flirtatious suggestion and a social taboo in a town of Money, Mississippi, which is just 260 miles from Harper Lee's home. This is her neighborhood. Uh, Milam, the murderer, is quoted as saying, when a black man, we won't use his words, gets close to mentioning sex with a white woman, he's tired of living. You know, Till's uh, whistle resulted in his being brutally murdered and his body thrown in the Tallahatchie River. And the injustice of Emmett Till's murder was the first great media event of the civil rights movement. The fact that the murderers, uh, who didn't even deny doing it, they were released in 67 minutes. I mean, that was immediate and it was a monumental legal benchmark. It literally made newspaper headlines in every major newspaper around the world, and it made a mockery of the American legal system. When Rosa Parks, on December 1st, 1955, just two months later, refused to give up her seat on that bus in Montgomery, she was thinking of Till. She later wrote, The news of Emmett's death caused me to participate in the cry for justice and equal rights. I mean, there are so many parallels between what happened in the Till case and how Lee constructs the Robinson case. You know, so much so that it's worth thinking about Emmett Till when we read the trial scene in Lee's book. First of all, the timing is the same. The Till murder happened in September, and Robinson's death occurred, and let me quote Lee here, when August was on the brink of September. You know, the lead prosecutor in the Till murder was an Attica-style hero by the name of Gerald Chatham. He famously prosecuted the murderers and described for the world, you know, their heinous acts. And he says this, They murdered that boy, and to hide their dastardly act, they tied barbed wire to his neck and to a heavy gin fan and dumped him into the river for the turtles and the fish. The, the crime of both Robinson and Till was the same, transgressing that, you know, that strict and inviolable social class rule of tempting a white woman. Uh, I told you how the vulgar Milam described it, but, you know, let's read how Atticus describes the same social system. This, again, is from Atticus's closing statement. What was the evidence of her offense? Tom Robinson is a human being. She must put Tom Robinson away from her. Tom Robinson was her daily reminder of what she did. What did she do? She tempted a Negro. She was white, and she tempted a Negro. She did something that in our society is unspeakable. She kissed a black man, not an uncle, but a strong, young Negro man. No code mattered to her before she broke it, but it came crashing down on her afterwards. Her father saw it. And the defendant has testified as to his remarks. What did her father do? We don't know, but there is circumstantial evidence to indicate that Mayella Yule was beaten savagely by someone who led almost exclusively with the left. You know, notice here the symbolic references to the right versus the left. That's something that we see throughout the book. I think we mentioned that in some other episodes. Yeah, we have. You know, there are two other parallels worth noting in both cases. The Emmett Till murder and now this case of Tom Robinson. The jury consists of rural uh, southern white men. In both cases, the overwhelming contradictory evidence leaves no ambiguity as to the reality of the situation. In both cases, and you know, we don't have time to get into all that happened in Mississippi, but in both cases... The community of fair-minded middle-class white people against their own humanity uh, and even their initial leanings, they end up supporting a pair of otherwise despised poor whites. Brian and Mylan are every bit as horrible as Bob Ewell. And in the case of Tom Robinson, Lee gives Robinson a physical handicap that makes it completely obvious that he could not have committed the murder. That's his arm. In the case of Till, Till had a handicap as well. He had a speech defect a stutter that he had had as a recurring side effect of having polio as a kid. It's possible, uh, and, and, you know, and since discussed, that his so-called wolf whistle uh, might not have been him whistling at all, but him talking specifically, him saying the words bubblegum and stuttering it and sounding like what would be described as a wolf whistle. I mean, he could not say his hard consonants. 
a couple of other interesting parallels. In the Robinson trial, as we already read, Atticus quotes Jefferson. Chatham, in his closing arguments in the Till case, does the exact same thing. In the Robinson case, and we'll see this in the Emmett Till case, the lawyers for the African-American, of course, in Till case, it was a prosecutor, and in the Robinson case, it's a defense lawyer. But in both cases, they make their cases ably and diligently with no help from the sheriff's office in obtaining evidence. Also, the judge in Maycomb, as we see throughout the trial, is clearly doing everything he can to support Atticus and Robinson to the point that Atticus wasn't even supposed to have gotten the case, but the judge made it happen. According to Miss Maudie, it was no accident. I mean, Scott Scout figures it out that Maxwell Green should have had the Thomas the Robinson case. There's lots of descriptions that happened during the trial to let us know that. Judge Taylor looked at Bob Ewell, let me quote, as if he were a three-legged chicken on a square egg. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in the Till case, um, Curtis Swango, the judge, also did the same sort of things. It's been said that he, uh, and I'm going to quote this, bent over backwards and won the respect of all, including the black congressman, Charles Diggs, who attended the proceedings. After the trial was over, Northern Papers praised both Swango and Cheatham for their, and I quote, devotion throughout this occasion to justice. Judge Swango was reelected, by the way, the next year after the Till trial, very much like Atticus was reelected to the state legislature after the Robinson trial. If we look at what happened after the closing arguments in both the Till trial and the Robinson trial, we'll see, though, one thing that is different and is worth noting. In the Till trial, the jury goes out and Sheriff-elect Dogan tells them to wait a while before coming out to make it look good. Uh, the jurors went out and they drank a Coke, and 68 minutes later, they came back with a non-guilty verdict. And this is a distinction that Lee wants to make, because in the Robinson trial, Lee does something different. According to Scout, it had a dreamlike quality. Scout says she saw the jury return, moving like underwater swimmers. We don't know exactly how long they deliberated, but it was certainly longer than the 68 minutes of the till trial. It could have been up to six hours. Jim, he, they're out so long, Jim is convinced that they're going to come back with a non-guilty verdict. And when they don't, he cries tears of anger. Atticus turns after they read the verdict, guilty, 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 and he walks out. But when he does, the entire African-American community that had been watching the trial stand up for him. But what's most important in the parallel that I want to point out with the Till case is that because of the actions of the lawyer standing in the face of the mob, being courageous, even though you know you're going to lose, the minds of the community changed. We see it in the book, first in the character of Al Anne Alexandra, but the entire community rejects the Yules to the point that Bob Yule sets out to murder Scout and Jim in revenge. Bob Yule acquired and lost the job in a matter of days, a fact according to the adult Scout who's narrating at this point, is unique in the annals of the 1930s. Atticus later explains to Ale in Alexandra that Bob Yule knows in his heart, and this is a quote, that few people in Maycomb really believed his and Mayella's yarns. He thought he'd be a hero, but all he got for his pain was, okay, we'll convict this man, but get back to your dump. I destroyed his last shred of credibility in that trial. Link Diaz, the neighbor, goes on to employ and defend Helen Robinson against Yule's harassments. Link Diaz humiliates Yule for doing what he had done to Helen and to begin with. And of course, Mr. Tate, the sheriff's defense of Boo Radley to Atticus, comes across in some sense that he himself is trying to pay penance for the injustice that he committed for his part in the Robinson death. He says this, I'm not a very good man, sir, but I am sheriff of Macomb County. Lived in this town all my life, and I'm going on 43 years old. Know everything that's happened here since before I was born. There's a black boy dead for no reason, and the man responsible for it's dead. Let the dead bury the dead this time, Mr. Finch. Let the dead bury the dead. The town conscious of Macomb, Alabama, 
is turning. Of course, the interesting real historical parallel is that uh, Bryant and Milam in the Till case were also rejected by both black and white elements in their community as well. After the trial, the stores their families owned were boycotted, all had to be closed or sold within 15 months. Milam tried to rent land to farm, but he couldn't. Uh, Bryant could not find work. Both were not accepted anywhere in the Mississippi Delta, and they had to move out. Bryant moved his family to Texas. They were totally shunned, both in their communities, but also nationally. Uh, Till's mother, Mrs. Mamie Bradley, after the trial, had requested that Emmett Till's body be sent back to Chicago, and she received it in the Illinois Central Terminal, which was the same terminal he'd left from two weeks previous to go on um, his, his vacation in Mississippi. There's a very famous picture that was taken when his body arrived back home. Mrs. Bradley is said to have collapsed and cried, Lord, take my soul. And there is uh, horror and pain in her face that was captured in the photo. What's interesting is that when you read the part in the book where Lee describes Helen Robinson receiving the news that Tom was being shot, Dill describes Helen as collapsing as well. And Scout, she just fell down in the dirt, just fell down in the dirt like a giant with a big foot just came along and stepped on her like you'd step on an ant. I mean, this isn't a parallel I noticed. It is one that's really been documented by historians. Interesting. You know, the final parallel and the one I think everyone has noticed, the press. The local press in Makeham exonerates Tom Robinson. According to Scout, let me quote, Mr. B.B. Underwood was at his most bitter and he couldn't have cared less who canceled advertising and subscriptions. But Makeham didn't play that way. Mr. Underwood could holler till he sweated and write whatever he wanted to. He'd still get his advertising and subscriptions. If he wanted to make a fool of himself in his paper, that was his business. Mr. Underwood didn't talk about miscarriages of justice. He was writing so children could understand. Mr. Underwood simply figured it was a sin to kill cripples, be they standing, sitting, or escaping. He likened Tom's death to the senseless slaughter of songbirds by hunters and children, and Makeham thought he was trying to write an editorial poetical enough to be reprinted in the Montgomery Advertiser. How could this be, I wondered, as I read Mr. Underwood's editorial. Senseless killing, Tom had been given due process of law to the day of his death. He had been tried openly and convicted by 12 good men, and true, my father had fought for him all the way. Then Mr. Underwood's meaning became clear. Atticus had used every tool available to free men to save Tom Robinson, but in the secret courts of men's hearts, Atticus had no case. Tom was a dead man the minute Mayella Yule opened her mouth and screamed. In uh, September of 1955, after Emmett Till's death and the exoneration of his murderers, uh, Nobel Prize winner William Faulkner, one of Mississippi's most famous sons, said this, If we in America have reached a point in our desperate culture when we must murder children, no matter for what reason or what color, we don't deserve to survive and probably won't. You know, we started out talking about childlike innocence. It's one of the thematic motifs that threads the entire book. The voice of the entire novel is the voice of child innocence. Before the book even begins, it's introduced by a quote by Charles Lamb. Lawyers, I suppose, were children once. There's an important identification with truth, innocence, courage, and change. What are we to make of all this if not to hear Lee's exoneration for us to return to that place, that place of childlike innocence? And next week, we will wrap up our discussion on how Lee wraps up her book. I know there's a lot more to say. We could never explore it all. But at the end of the trial, we, like Jim, are led to feel low. Jim struggles with hopelessness. But Lee will not leave us in a place of hopelessness. No, she won't. And thank goodness for that. I mean, this is a book of acceptance, acceptance for all of us. And, you know, and thank goodness for that. Um, next episode, that's where we will go. We hope you'll come back and finish out the series. As always, thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed our discussion. And if you did, please honor us by liking us, subscribing to us, and commenting on uh, our podcast platforms. It helps the internet gods recognize and find us. And as always, 
Please text an episode to a friend. Spread the word about our existence. Visit us on social media. Check us out at How to Love Lit Podcast. Visit our website. And you can even email us at Christy at HowToLoveLitPodcast.com. Peace out. Peace out.